Hello and welcome. Today we're going to be talking about aesthetics, race, and ethnicity. This is relevant for sociology because we're talking about how did culture become associated with race and then how did one specific race gain cultural domination over others and then how were systems and structures instituted to oppress minority voices in order to maintain a cultural domination of a one specific racial voice. So, the objectives for this chapter, again, are to examine how dominant culture and race are associated. We're going to be looking at art as a medium for challenging stereotypes and gaining racial justice, how critics are often white, uh, the racialized artistic divisions, cultural appropriation, and sociologists, how we demystify and fight to end racial discrimination for racial democracy. So again, when we look at the history of culture, we've talked about this many times, but again, how did Europeans who eventually began calling themselves white and their descendants gain power in America? Remember, it's by using war and violence and you know maintaining systems of privilege, power, and oppression. And we've talked a lot about the history of this. But again, this not only economic and social domination, that also resulted in the culture of America being dominated by whites, be by European culture. Okay, so when you did your typical American assignment, especially early on first week, you know, you guys are looking at that. You're looking at when did the culture of America become dominated by, you know, the white voice, by the white standards, by the white aesthetics, and why were minorities not allowed to speak, and why were their voices not heard, and why did they not have power over their lives, and why was their not art not appreciated and heard from? Why are, you know, again, we discussed it, but why are there only old white men in all the books until, you know, the late 1800s and then the 1900s when minority voices started to come out? And again, when you look at the history of America, that's what you're looking at. You're looking at the history of Europeans dominating society, stratifying society into social classes that are unequally distributed across society, maintaining privileged positions for themselves, and then oppressing all non-Europeans, non-whites. Okay, so again, the association between culture, race, and social class, again, is that society was divided into classes, those separate social classes became associated with races when specific races were subjugated into the lower classes, such as all non-whites, and then you had poor white culture, middle class white culture, and upper class white culture. But again, when you start to ask questions like how did cultures become segregated along racial lines? Where did black culture come from? Where does Asian culture come from? What does that mean? You have to ask how the cultures got segregated in the first place, okay? That is, again, the dark, sad reality of America is that through segregation, you ended up with race-based cultures. And then social class became associated with race-based cultures because, you know, non-whites, again, were subjugated in the lower class. They had a separate culture. And then you had whites that got subjugated into the lower class. They had a sub separate culture for middle class and upper class whites. And so again, it's very complicated when you start to examine the association between race, culture, and social class, but that's kind of what we're doing. And because social classes and cultures were segregated, again, whose voices were really heard? You know, who had the power over forms of media, over art and culture and museums and things along those lines? So your book is delving into all of this in this chapter, okay? Um, so non-whites were historically denied access to art schools, denied access to their work getting produced, denied access to learning. Um, your book sadly talks about non-whites being put on display in zoos, being depicted as primitive to justify racial supremacy of whites. And if you look at the World's Fair of Chicago and Paris in the late 1800s, for example, you know, the biggest display was taking over 400 Africans and putting them in these cages in what the book described as their native environment, which is totally false because they're like hardly even wearing clothes. So again, totally unacceptable.
Uh, but whites, again, controlled the dominant image of what it meant to be black or Asian or, you know, Native American, for example. Um, the book talks about how African Americans, and this is just straight quoting out of your book, were depicted with uh, white people dressing as African Americans, wore a black face. They depicted the characters as lazy, ignorant, subservient, buffoonish, uppity, as slaves. They celebrated lynching, often childish all of which were negative stereotypes that have no reality in fact at all whatsoever. But again, when you look at the origin of negative stereotypes, they were culturally constructed as white people began to depict other races in negative ways, okay? So a great question is, how are other races portrayed historically in the media? Think about how Asians are portrayed in the old cartoons and the way that they're, you know, the way they talk or, you know, the stereotypical person from Latin America and those characters are Africans like Aunt Jemima and now Aunt Jemima is not allowed to be used anymore you know and again there's reasons for all of this so voices from the underground minorities again had to take a stance at some point and just say we're not going to allow oppressive whites to dominate the narrative and so you totally the book talks about examples of singing at Auschwitz and Dachau how they're not going to let the Nazis stop them from their culture the ghost dance from Native Americans even though it was banned by white African white Americans African songs in the cotton fields you know we stripped all Africans of their culture and we tried to impose white culture upon them but they held on to it in little ways through, you know, singing in the fields, for example. And again, you had the development of non-white jazz and blues. And the book talks about how, you know, there's when black jazz musicians started picking up on jazz, you know, a big part of that was to create a non-white version of jazz, you know. Uh, but again, how did music help combat racism? And the book talks about when you get groups together and people that you know are white and they start hearing things that are made by black artists for example that made white people want to go see black artists and so that led to this you know beginning of the integration between people so you know when you look at art you do have some positives and negatives yes it's been culturally segregated for a long time and only white voices were allowed to be heard but music was one of the things that brought people together in the first place which is really interesting um, but then the book again talks about how whites culturally assimilated that music though and then so the non-white music that was being coming popular by white artists then the white business owners went in and took power and you know they got rich off the music while the non-white artists did not the rise of multiculturalism so in the 1920s you began to see a shift where the idea of whiteness being exclusively portrayed people started recognizing that all other cultures have great things too. So all of a sudden, whites started, you know, non-white voices started being heard. But again, whites still controlled the business and the access to non-white culture. Okay, non-white forms of culture, such as music and art and theater and things along those lines. So non-whites essentially had less control of their product and it became big business for whites to culturally assimilate non-white art forms and then make money off of it. Again, we live in a capitalist society that is dominated historically by whites. So they control the systems and structures that are able to distribute it and make it popular and you know, things along those lines. But again, art is a medium to address privilege, power, and oppression. So not only is it something that is often usurped by whites and dominated by white culture, art can also be used to address it. One of my favorite ones is the art of the black power movement. And my favorite, I think, art of all of that is this picture of the white egg. And then you have a black fist breaking through, like, you know, like, a, like being born and crashing through that white egg, and then you have the, the black power fist coming out, and that's my favorite one of all. And I think that's where the actual, I mean, I have to look into the origin of the, uh, the black fist. That's actually something I need to look into myself. Um, but that's one of my favorite paintings of that, and it represents that. Uh, but also lyrics, comedy, plays, novels, music, TV, and other media can also be used to address privilege, power, and oppression. Racial representation in art. How does media represent racial groups and racial domination? And again, that's what we're talking about. White portrayal of non-white groups tends to be incredibly accurate. 
And um, think about how white writers, when they try to use colloquialisms to represent non-whites and how it's written, it's really just how a white person thinks a non-white person sounds, okay? So the book just finds the white aesthetic as they rely on an unspoken edict that treats the white body and the white experience as normal, an edict that for some of us connects with our innermost presuppositions of the world. And again, so because whites dominated the culture, white and white culture was portrayed as normal. And so non-white culture was portrayed as, you know, and that's a dark question, okay? But again, so you see it across the board, the whitening of fashion, dolls, children lighten their skin when asked to draw themselves. This is what your book was talking about. And again, it goes back to this idea that we all have internalized, socialized bias. And so if the dominant culture is controlled by whites, then dominant culture socializes a white way of life. The white body is normal. Okay, and that's, again, very sad. And then your book talks about some sad personal experiences, like Asians trying to unsquint their eyes. And they had the book talked about the guy using toothpicks to see what they would look like with a more open eye. And plastic surgery being done for that. Africans and Hispanics seeking to get nose jobs to have a smaller nose, for example, to look, you know, more white. And that's, again, a really dark reality. Uh, whites are overrepresented in commercials, TV, and movies. Whites deny that racialized, socialized issues exist. Um, and the book talks about you have the Brady Bunch appearing and you have this typical American family where all is peachy and it's being aired during the race riots. Uh, country music tends to be all white and racialized, racialized nostalgia is addressed in many songs. And the book talks about Toby Keith writing the song, you know, about how blacks are portrayed that video, and I can't even say it because the word, but check out that part in the book about talking about Toby Keith and uh, Willie Nelson making a video and how black people are portrayed in the book, in the, in the video, uh, but it's in your book. So typical American life is depicted as a typical white family. And again, this is the normalizing of white culture and denormalizing of non-white culture. The book also talks about the removal of Confederate monuments. And again, so you do have this you know, change in modern times where we're trying to deconstruct institutionalized racism. But, you know, despite how many monuments we take down, still some people are fighting against it. And your book has a picture of Robert E. Lee and Jefferson Davis, the head of the Confederacy, and that stone mountain. And they refuse to take down the stone mountain. That's just like a Mount Rushmore, but a Mount Rushmore for the Confederacy. And that's a big deal, and Georgia is struggling with it because you know people are trying to put businesses in Georgia, but their racist history and their racist present is going against that. Uh, the racist aesthetic. The white aesthetic seeks to normalize whiteness. The white racial aesthetic seeks to depict non-whites in negative ways, and again, the dominant culture rules over people's ideology and the way they think because they have power over society. So if the dominant culture is run and ruled and controlled by whites, then what is being portrayed across dominant culture? So again, white people distort perceptions and demonize minorities historically. And essentially, by applying negative stereotypes and portraying people inaccurately, they're dehumanizing minority groups. For example, the book talks about how news always seeks out that person who speaks completely broken English and vernacular is because that's how like white people in the news want to portray minorities, as if like someone who can't speak formally. Okay, I mean, again, go to the South. All white people in the South speak broken English. Y'all <laughs> ain't got, again, anti-racist aesthetic. Throw a gear in the wrench of institutionalized racism. Again, the goal of the anti-racist aesthetic is to address our history and address institutionalized racism and seek out diversity and seek out what is good art aside from what is racially dominated art. Uh, whites are overrepresented in award ceremonies and art museums on radio play. Um, you have a cultural segregation of art forms such as narrow casting and shows.
Uh, banjo used to be for non-whites, but then at some point whites adopted it. Piano was historically a white culture, and then if, you know over time non-whites adopted it. Is hip hop for whites or is it for non-whites? You know, really good question. Was Eminem accepted as a hip hop artist? Um, and then the book talks about hip hop actually as a weapon, but also can be a mechanism by which specific groups are negatively portrayed due to content of music, for example. Your book also discusses the association between race, culture, and social class when it talks about highbrow culture for you know media that's directed specifically toward uh, middle and up, higher upper classes, and then low block broke brow culture for lower classes, and then popular culture that meets the general taste of the masses. Uh, when it comes to cultural appropriation, you have cultural segregation into race-based cultures. Again, how did our cultures in the United States become segregated? You know, and you have to look at, again, the history of segregation in the United States to really understand this. But then, because of cultural appropriation, when someone who was white or the dominant culture, for example, starts to like something that's non-white, then they adopt that into their culture and it becomes part of the dominant culture, which then becomes part of white culture. Um, when members of one ethnic or racial group adopt a cultural product associated for, with another, that's known as cultural appropriation. And again, is it ethnic theft for the dominant culture, the white culture of America, to adopt things like hip-hop music? Or is that music and the blues? You know, or is that historically and still presently only allowed to be a black form of music, for example? And so you have to ask these really big questions. Um, racist appropriation, again, is the idea of strategic anemia, um, amnesia, sorry, strategic amnesia, which is denying the fact that it wasn't created by white people, and then white people trying to pretend like they're the ones who originated it, and then whitewashing, you know, taking something from a different minority culture and then trying to whiten it. And the book talks about why is Elvis considered the king of rock and roll when it should be Chuck Berry, right? And then why is Clapton the lead of blues, you know, when it should be Robert Johnson, right? Whites get rich off of cultural appropriation. And again, that's the association between capitalism, social class, race, and culture. You know, And so as whites adopt different cultures and then try to whiten it and make it their own, they're also going in and you know, they're the ones who control the systems and the structures. So they're the ones who control the capitalist economy. They're the ones who control the institutions. Therefore, they're the ones getting rich, OK? And then anti-racist appropriation is refusing to de-racialize or dehistoricize the art form that inspires it and gives credit where it's due. Again, recognizing that black people created the blues. It wasn't made by whites, you know, and then give that credit to where it should be gone. Um, to wrap it up, the book concludes with the sociology of art, the art of sociology. And again, the sociology of art is the study of systems and structures and institutions and social behavior associated with art and music and all their forms of media, poetry, writing, novels, whatever it might be. We, our goal is to expose systems of cultural domination and recognize how white have historically dominated culture, spoken and had power over what was considered the norm, the power over dictating what the typical American family should look like, and then imposing a white way of life upon other people. The sociology recognizes this. We recognize that minority voices from women to racial and ethnic minorities, sexual minorities, disability status, their voices are not recognized. Their access is not equitable to that of whites. So we seek to create a more diverse world where people can rise up based upon their merit and have the skills and knowledge necessary despite their social class location to be able to be productive citizens and fulfill elite social roles that are not just for white people. And again, we seek to overcome privilege, power, and oppression, not just in society in general, but in all institutions of society, including art and culture, okay? Thank you very much. Appreciate it.